Liddy, Chapter 7, South to Freedom Liddy set out at once, or nearly at once. First, Tryphenia made, made the girl put on her own second-best uh, pair of boots. They were, of course, too large for Liddy, so she had to wait while the cook fetched two extra pairs of stockings and paper which uh, to stuff the toes. When Liddy objected, Tryphenia muttered, A person can't walk to Massachusetts barefoot, not in April. She can't. Next, Tryphenia made her wait while she packed her a parcel of food large enough to feed a table of harvesters, and finally she gave her a tiny cloth purse with five silver dollars in it. It's too much, Liddy protested. I'm not having your dead body on my conscience, the cook said. It will be enough for a coach fare and the stops along the way. The only tavern food I trust is my own. But the mistress, you leave the mistress to me. I'll pay you. I'll pay you back the money, with interest when I can, Liddy promised. Tryphenia only shook her head and gave her a pat on the buttocks, as though she were five years old. Just don't forget me, eh? Give your old friend a thought, now and again. That's all the interest I'll be wanting. It was three in the afternoon before she could even start her journey, but she would not let Tryphenia persu persuade her to wait. She might let the mistress talk her into staying, or lose the nerve if she didn't set out at once. Her heart was light, even if her feet felt clumsy in her chair, makeshift boots, and oversized stockings. She remembered Ezekiel and thought, He walked north for freedom, and I'm walking south. She had forgotten, in the excitement, that she had already walked about ten miles that day, but her feet remembered. Long before the dark, they were chafing in the unaccustomed bindings of stockings and ill-fitted boots, reminding her that she had done too much. She sat down on a rock and took the boots off, but before long she felt chilled, so she put them on against again and started out, but more slowly than before. Then, just before dusk, the sky opened and it began to rain. Not light spring showers, but cold, soaking torrents of rain streaming down her face, icicling revelets down to her chest and legs. She was obliged, reluctantly, to stop in the next village and seek shelter for the night. The mistress of the local inn was at first shocked to see a young girl traveling alone, and then solicitous, "'You look near drowned!' she cried as she asked where she, or where she was heading. "'Lowell, is it? Well, the stagecoach will be coming through at the end of the week. Work for me till then, and I'll give you board.' Liddy hesitated, but her sodden clothes and blistered feet reminded her of how unsuited it was to continue the journey. She gratefully accepted the mistress' offer and worked so hard that before the week was out that the woman was begging her to forget Lowell and stay on. But Liddy was not to be persuaded. She boarded, or boarded, boarded the coach on Thursday, and in the same dismal rain she arrived in, handing over three of her precious dollars to the driver, she settled herself in the, of the or corner of the carriage. There were only two other passengers, a man and a woman, who seemed to be married, though they hardly spoke to each other. The woman gave Liddy's dress and shawl a strange and strange boots a critical once over with her eyes, and then settled again to her knitting, which the bumping of the coach made difficult. With the muddy roads, it took two days to get to Windsor. They had not even left Vermont. Liddy often wished she had saved her dollars and walked, rain or no rain. Surely she could have made it just as fast, but at least the disagreeable people left the coach at Windsor. In the, uh, the bed in the inn was infested with bugs, so she felt both filthy and itchy the next morning, and was not happily surprised that the coach, which had seemed overcrowded with three, was now to carry six as far to Lowell. One of the passengers was a girl her own age. Liddy wanted to ask her, too, was she going to or going for a factory girl, but she had a young man with her who appeared to be her brother, so Liddy was hesitant to speak. Then, too, she remembered the look the previous female passenger had given her. The six of them were jammed into the carriage. There was hardly any room for any of them to move, yet the rolling and pitching of the coach seemed worse than better for the road. Liddy tied or tried to sit delicately on one hip and then the other to spread the bruising out, if possible. One of the gentlemen lit a large pipe, and the odor of it nearly made her rich. Fortunately, another gentleman reminded him reminded him sternly that there were ladies present, and the first man reluctantly tapped his pipe against the metal fixings of the door. But the stench had already been added to the air in foul breath and strong body odors. Liddy longed for a healthy smell of farmyard. People were so much fouler than critters, and still— 
When the others weren't concentrating on keeping their seats in the swaying coach, they were looking at her, at her clothes especially. She was, or at first she was mortified, but the longer they rode, the angrier she became. How rude they were, these so-called gentry. Everyone's clothes were a disgrace before they had reached Lowell. The thaw and the spring rains had turned parts of the roadway into muddy or sloads, and despite the coachman's skill, early on the last morning they were stuck fast. Passengers were all obliged to alight, and the four men ordered the co ordered by the coachman to push the wheels out of the rut. Liddy watched the help hapless gentlemen heave and shove and sweat, all to no avail. The coachman yelled encouragement from above. The men grunted and cursed below their fancy breeches and overcoats turned brown with mud, and their lovely beaver hats went rolling down the road. After at least a quarter uh, a quarter of an hour of watching, she could stand their stupidity no longer. Liddy took off her worn shawl, tied it about her waist, and tucked it up her or tucked her skirts under it. She found a flat stone and put it under the mirrored wheel. Um, then when she or then she waited in her narrow shoulders, shoving two of the gaping men aside as she set her own strong right shoulder against the rear wheel, ordered the men to rear the boot, and called out one, two, three, heave. Above, she heard laughter of the coachman. The men beside her were not smiling. They did push together, er, but they did push together. The wheel rolled over the stone, and the coach was free to continue the journey. She was filthy, but she hardly cared. She could only think of how ignorant, how useless her fellow passengers had been. None of them thanked her, but she hardly noticed. She was eager to be going, but not to ride inside. She looked up to the smiling coachman. Can I come up, she called. He nodded. Liddy scrambled up beside him. None of the gentlemen offered her hand, but she needed none, having spent her life climbing trees and ladders and roofs. The coachman was still chuckling as he gave the horses a crack of the whip. Cries of protest rose up from the passengers below. He jerked the reins, his eyes twinkling, as more cries came up from the irate, inmates as they tried to dismantle their bodies in the carriage and settle themselves on the seats once more he shook his head at liddy and held the pawning team for a few minutes until the jostling in the carriage finally ceased you're a hardy one you are he said reaching for the box behind him to pull out a heavy robe here this will keep the chill off she wrapped the robe around her body or her head and her body silly fool she said not the common sense of a quill pig's monks the lot of them. Why didn't you tell them what to do, eh? What, he said, and lose that entertainment? Liddy couldn't help but laugh, remembering the sight of the uh, sight of those sweating, swearing, filthy gentlemen, and how they were further poisoning uh, the already stale air of the carriage with their odor in, mud, in road mud. Indeed, someone was already raising the shade to let a bit of cold, fresh air in. So you're, uh, so you're for the factory life. Liddy nodded. I need the money. He glanced sideways at her. Those women dress like Boston ladies, he said. I don't care for fancy dresses. There are debts on my farm. In your farm? Now, is it? My father, she said. But he headed west four years ago, and we haven't heard. You're a stout one, he said. Ain't you brothers to, or ain't you brothers to help? One, she said. But he'd be a great help, only my mother put him out to a miller. So until, have you someone to look after you in Lowell, a relative or a friend? She shook her head. I'll do all right on my own. I have no doubt about that, he said. But a friend to put in a word can't help. Let me take you to my sister's. She runs a boarding house. Number five, it is, of Concord Manufacturing Corporation. I'm obliged by your kindness, but... I think or think of it as payment for your help. She could have had or she could have had it out in no time, but you but never such fun. Coaching can be worrisome. Lonesome job, my girl. I take pleasure where I can. Did you see those gentlemen's faces having to be rescued by a slip of a farm girl? They crossed the bridge into the city late that afternoon. In this er, in city it surely was. See it seemed to Liddy that that there was as many buildings crowded before her as sheep in a shearing shed, but there were not saw or they were not soft and murmuring as sheep. They were huge and foreboding in the gray light of the afternoon. She would not have believed that the world contained as much brick as there were in a single building here. 
They were giants, five or six stories high, and long as the length of a large pasture. Chimneys, belching smoke, uh, reached to the low-hanging sky, and the noise of it. Her impulse was to cover her ears, but she held her hands tightly in her lap. She would not begin to be afraid now. She who had stared down the bear and conversed easily with a runaway slave. The other passengers, in their muddy clothing and their various trunks, alighted um, at the Merrimack, uh, Merrimack Hotel. Liddy could tell at a glance it was far too grand for her purse and person. In the end, she waited until the coachman had seen the horses in the carriage taken care of and then let him walk her to his sister's boarding house. I've brought you a little chip of Vermont granite, he explained to the plump, smiling woman who met them at the door. And uh, then he added, "We'd best come in the uh, come in the back. Run into a little muddy stretch on the way down."